The following show is a paid program. Hey family, how you doing today? We have Fred Alexander, the original, from the original Lakeside. Hey, my friend, how you doing? I'm good, man. How about yourself, man? Man, we made it. We made it. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> you are closing us out for the legends of R&B. We first had Michael Cooper, my friend, from the okay. Confunction. Then we had okay. uh, Cheryl Cooley from climax oh, yeah. Yeah. we had these are all your friends we had uh felton well we pilot. did a pay-per-view yeah we yeah. had felton pilot for confunction and then oh great on, yeah and then on yesterday uh we had uh uh charlie singleton i gotta remember okay uh, from okay. cameo and now you close us out right. with lakeside how did you get into the music business oh man i I've been playing music since I was in the first grade. <laughs> uh, going to Catholic school, I played, uh, my father was a trumpet player and my mother sung, so I I wanted to play trumpet like him, but a doggone trumpet hurts. <laughs> so I had to lead a trumpet alone. I, I didn't like trumpet very much. Uh -huh. it, it's a nice instrument, but to play it, is just so painful. I mean, drums are painful enough, right? But to play trumpet was murder. So I ended up learning keyboards and drums. So okay, sounds good. I understand Dayton, Ohio. Yeah, Dayton is where a lot of the acts came from. I mean, originally, I'm from uh, Dallas, Texas, Ooh, but really? uh, Dayton was like my second home. Okay. Uh, especially when I got in the group, because I got in the group maybe six, seven years after the group was started. Mm -hmm. And I had my own band in Dallas. It's, this is a crazy name, Liquid Funk. <laughs> it was so funky, it was, it was liquid. I know that's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> It was like the runs, okay? <laughs> oh my God! And then just talking about <laughs> I know, how I know, right? How that's Lakeside terrible, came. Boy. You, you, you know, you're the first person I told that to, so that's <laughs> terrible story. <laughs> well, you know what? Just getting you on the air, we're so excited about it. Everybody loves this whole week of legends of R and B, and I'm telling you what. Just looking at Lakeside, one of the songs, let's talk about Fantastic Voyage. When it yeah. comes on, I mean, just to hear the beat just get started, everybody stands up, you know? Well, you know, that record, uh, actually, we had to come up with another record mm -hmm. for the album because Dick Griffey, you know, he liked the, the album, and by that time, we were kind of, you know, kind of producing and writing, you know, really learning how to write. Mm -hmm. Because at first we really wasn't good at writing. I mean, when I had my band, I wrote a song called Baby Don't Be So Blue. <laughs> I think I was like 12 or 13 years old. Uh -huh. You know, that was my only experience at trying to write a song and go in the studio. Mm -hmm. But with Lakeside, um, we were with Dick Griffey and we were going to work with uh, Leon Silvers. Dick said, well, I'm going I'm to let Leon work with you guys because I got this new producer. He's really good. He's from the Silvers family. So we were like, well, OK, that's cool. And we kind of finished the whole album, but we wasn't really in the, fr in, in the beginning known as a funk group. Mm. You know, Fred Lewis really kind of got us to doing funk because he played a synthesizer like the old ARP synthesizer. Mm -hmm. And he could play with one finger. So he had this 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 groove and we just kind of took up on the groove on It's All The Way Live and, and just started singing the hook. It's all the way live, you know? And uh -huh. it kind of took off from there. And Dick Griffin was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm liking that. And then when it came to the Fantastic Voyage album, 
he was like, well, you know, this is a good album, but y'all need that one more hot record, you know? Mm -hmm. And we was like, okay, now how are we gonna come up with this other record? So we were sort of like in rehearsal because we were bored and had just came off of the Budweiser Superfest. So, you know, it's like that last date. Right. You're just in shock because it's like, man, you know, we're not on the road anymore. We got to go in and do put in some work and <laughs> rehearse and all that kind of stuff. So we went in rehearsal and we was kicking it around. And uh, we had like two or three grooves, but none of them worked together by themselves. So, you know, like the one, we had that groove and then we had dun, dun, that one worked by itself. And the other one worked by itself. We was like, well, what if we put the two together? Mm. And we put the two together like, uh, we just want you to be nothing but pleasure. You know, when it went to that section. And we said, oh man, that could be, that could be the bridge. The other part could be the hook. But then we had, we didn't really know how to rap. You know, rap was just coming in then. This mm -hmm. was like 1980. Right. Rap was just starting to take off. And, but wasn't nobody really rapping yet. You know, single people were rapping. Curtis Blow, all those cats, you know, Grandmaster Flash, all those guys was rapping. But it wasn't any groups mm -hmm. that was rapping. You know, every group sort of had you know, like they were one singer and we were a group that had four singers and our whole concept was have a singing group and a band together. So we'd have the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. And what happened, we were all like, you know, rapping and Dick Griffey loved the rap because it was a choral rap because, you know, we were harmonized. Right. So we harmonized the rap mm -hmm. and Dick Griffey loved it. So, he said, but one thing is wrong. He said, now, you know, Dick kind of knew his stuff too. You know, Dick was like, what if we go in the studio and we move the rap from the middle of the song to the beginning of the song? Because in that first 10 or 15 seconds, either they're going to love the record or they're going to toss it in the corner. Right, right. So we put the rap at the beginning and it was number one record. I mean, we were like, number seven on the charts and the next week we went to number three michael jackson was number two and stevie wonder was number one and we jumped over michael jackson to number one and and stevie wonder dropped down to number five or number six something like that but we sit at number one for a long time, now, but we this, couldn't believe this is not hard we had a number huh? one record over, Steve, over uh Michael Jackson, you know. Right. Heartbreak Hotel, right? Heartbreak Hotel. We couldn't believe go. it. It was like, what? <laughs> you know, I had a commercial go, what? Exactly. So we but it was it was nice and we had a good time. And that's sort of how Fantastic Voyage was developed. You know, it's funny, mm -hmm. just from the camaraderie of the rest of the guys is how that record developed where we all wrote it together. So that was actually an event of us actually everybody had having input but it, it worked out absolutely. the rest is history absolutely just looking at that and we've talked amongst the other legends people don't young people don't know that at this time coming in just start of the 80s is video that's where video popped in video wasn't yeah. in and a lot of you know young people of course that's common video is common <laughs> I mean, our, our first video was a video <laughs> on Casey Kasem's show on a ship. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we ended up turning that into a video to represent Fantastic Boys. Right, right, right. And it, it was only just because we was on this TV show. <laughs> <laughs> and looking back at that, just seeing that and just seeing how it has evolved over the years, my God. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, it's zooming along, isn't it? <laughs> you know, uh, the, the only thing that didn't really, well, you know, funk had its time. Yeah. 
But funk, you know, you don't even really hear people talk about funk anymore. You when, know. But, you know, James Brown was, you know, the single guy that was doing Keep It Funky. It was uh -huh. about funk, you know. He, I mean, when that came out of his mouth and then we got a chance to, you know, do a couple of shows with James Brown. And I remember the first show we did with him was a show we did for the Black Caucus with uh, President uh, Clinton and Gore. Mm -hmm. And we shared the same dressing room and we were just like in awe that we're actually in the same room <laughs> with James Brown. Right, right, right. I mean, I could barely even speak to him because <laughs> every everything I said to him, I just kept looking at him like, man, this is James Brown. This is the real James Brown. Right. You right, know, right. And, and I mean, he was just a legend already because when I was a kid, I used to go see James Brown uh, when he used to put have, have the microphone in his air. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so dope. It's like, where's the microphone? And the microphone was in his hair. That's too funny. And that's how he used to come on stage. But uh, we got a chance to hang with my uh, with uh, with James Brown, and you know, he just told us always, whatever you do, keep it funky, mm -hmm. because that's what people will feel. Wow. And they don't call it funk now, but everything that's out is a derivative of funk. It, it is so you know it is and Look, you know i guess because there are no no other there are no new bands mm -hmm. so and all of the bands that were out were trying to be funky i mean roger and zap and you know uh heat wave or how players you know everybody was trying to you know come up with that funk and we weren't necessarily trying to come up with fun it just happened it just happened you know it was like just from being together, a lot of magic happens. Right. But we, you know, we we write a lot of ballads, you know, and people don't even really think of us as a ballad group, but I mean songs like Real Love and Say Yes and mm -hmm. you know, we 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 love writing love songs. But that was interesting. We're just gonna throw this out there that it was so many it was a lot of guys together and you all kept it together as friends. Just the harmony of that many guys, you know. Yeah, we we still together now. We over forty years. We just right. got through doing uh, the pay per view with uh, Confunction and mm -hmm. Climax, and uh, you know it, it was. And y'all girls and peoples was on the show also, and we're still together. You know, we still. Uh, uh, it's a blessing mm -hmm. to be in demand. You know, because of COVID, we've kind of had to you know, sit back and stay safe. Right. You know, and, and not flying all over the place, you know, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, once things open up again, yeah, you know, we, 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 we definitely want to be back on the road. We just have to really be careful with this COVID because I mean, we're not no spring chickens anymore. So, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we can't afford to get it. Exactly. Get a sneeze, okay? Exactly. <laughs> what have you learned along the way, Mr. Fred? What have you learned along the way? I've learned that the people will tell you who you are. Wow. That's if you just present yourself to them, they'll let you know mm -hmm. who you are. All you got to do is just entertain and perform. And along the way, we've learned that people really love good entertainment yes so we always enjoyed being that person that in entertained you i mean even when i was a kid in school i was the room nut you know always entertaining <laughs> playing something uh you know i remember i spent some time my mom moved us to chicago for a couple of years and i used to beat on the radiators mm. and uh people would get mad at school because that's all I did was I couldn't wait to beat on the radiators. I came with my drumsticks and I played on the radiator because in Catholic school, they didn't really have no band. Right. So when I, when I, by the time I got back to Texas, you know, bands was in full force. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was in high school band, marching band, 
concert band, every kind of band <laughs> <laughs> you could have. I was right. in, and then I had my own band. So, right. yeah. Yeah, that's good. And looking at that, what advice would you give new artists now? Well, I think, you know, it, it should be more bands. I mean, yeah. especially, you know, in the black community, we've kind of, uh, I, I like the new technology. We use the new technology. We learned it because we want to, you know, be we around the musicians that know the technology, but also know our history mm -hmm. on how to write a song. And I think, I guess the, the most I could say to somebody is when you write a song, try to write a story. Just like if, if you was talking to the girl, uh, give you a great example, say yes. Okay, the opening line to say yes is, even now when it seems you have almost everything, you still get lonely, girl. Don't you get lonely at night? But the worst of it all, every time I give you a call, you still resist me when all I want to do is to give all I can give so that we can live in ecstasy just you and I in love, you know, and be poetic. <laughs> if you say yes, we sell the stars, you know, and you know how the song goes. But anyway, <laughs> that that's, you know, I, I just think that you should write a song like a conversation, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and tell it just like a conversation. And, and we're not really poetic anymore, but I think we should get back to that because I never knew a girl that didn't like you to be poetic when you was talking to her. Mm -hmm. So guys, if you're trying to catch women, <laughs> be poetic. <laughs> you just gave them some information. You dro just dropped you know something know? on them. <laughs> hey, buddy, so, you know, we have the music business. So looking at the music business as it is, we say it's 10% music and 90% business. And many that have gone into music have really lost on the business side. What advice would you give them? Well, you know, that's a hard one, man, because it's not a business no more. I mean, it's like a a conglomerate. I mean, look at the radio <laughs> stations. I mean, they go and get, what do they call them? Not advisors. What do they call these guys now? They go in and they listen and you say, well, you played anything? No, I've never played anything. Uh, but you're supposed to be an expert on what's good and what's bad. Oh, well, I know records. So you don't have the passion anymore. They throw any kind of record up there now and then people uh, miss out because yeah. they don't get exposed to everything that's out there. Right. I think the business needs to, it needs to open up. Mm -hmm. It really does. And, and we need to stop uh, putting shackles on the DJs. Let the mm -hmm. DJs get off. They mm -hmm. are the ones that know music more than anybody at the station. It's the guy that's spinning the records. Right. You know, and they have a love for the records and they know the history. And, you know, they can, they get back. I could sit up and talk to a DJ all day long about history of, of records. Right. We need to stop making it where if a guy, I remember a friend of mine at a, at a radio station, I won't mention any names, mm -hmm. but uh, they're a Houston based station. No. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> he called me one day and said, man, I'm so frustrated. And I'm like, well, what's, what's wrong, man? I can't play this. You know, if it don't come up on this computer, I can't play it. Right. I say, man, look, you got to eat. You got to feed your family. Don't lose your job behind trying right. to play one of our records. I feel really bad. Right. All we can do is just hope that it open up again. Mm -hmm. And the people at the top that's sitting up in the boardroom with the cigar will realize <laughs> the importance of giving people more adversity. Yes. You know, that's about the only way. I mean, if they open it up, they'll sell even more records. Mm -hmm. They have even more people listening to the radio station because you know back in the day radio station was all about the community it was it was right community was wanted you know they mm -hmm. called hey man call in you know if you got a request right you could call in and request your record 
And if that record got enough requests, mm -hmm. that record moved up the charts. That's the way it used to be done. But now you can't even call in and, you know, uh, say anything, you know, to a DJ. You can't even make a suggestion. Right. You know, so I think it needs to get back to that. And I think it needs to get back to closer to the real community, which are the people in the streets that listen to the records. Absolutely. I love that. I love what you said about that. Now that COVID-19 has impacted us, man, it started at the end of February, then shut us down really in March, and we've still been shut down. Wow. All well, you know, we, we, were, we were lucky to be able to still do some things. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to like scoot around real quickly and and suit up and put on a hazmat suit and jump on the plane, <laughs> you know. But we did uh, one of the most historic gigs that we did this year was we did Juneteenth in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Wow. And I think the very next day, Herman Cain and Trump and all those guys came the next day. God bless his soul, you know. Yeah. Uh, but they all, uh, Herman came in, I think, a, a day early. But, you know, Reverend Al Sharpton, spoke and then we went on after river uh -huh. and this was a really nice concert for us to be in the middle of COVID. i think this right. was back in this was juneteenth yes yeah, and then yeah. we, we we got off the road and we didn't do anything again until we did the pay-per-view in las vegas september wow but back in march uh, we got kind of got shut down with everybody else. We were supposed to do San Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, we were supposed to do Colorado. We were supposed to do Alabama. I mean, we was all over the place. And boom, it just shut down. We must have lost 20 dates. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. like that. But looking and so you, now. Fred, Fred huh? looking at you real quick, though. 40 years, man, you're not even looking at it. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what, what you're hey, doing. Hey, man, maybe it's, maybe it's the drums, you know, because, <laughs> I mean, they, they keep in shape. Believe me, if you don't stay in shape, the drums will beat you up and let you know it. Yeah. yeah, yeah so, yeah. you know, and then, you know, uh, we, 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 we were on the road a lot, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like we like performing all the time because, it keeps the band so sharp. I mean, when you're sharp like that and and you're rolling and, you know, everything is pumping, it's like you could sit on drums, they just play themselves, you know, because, you know, <laughs> you just, <laughs> it's like that, you know. And, and now after over 40 years, man, it seemed like it was yesterday wow. that uh, we was in our rehearsal hall that, we used to call it doo doo records because everything coming out of there was going to be funky. <laughs> and uh, everybody wanted to come to doo doo records. Mm. And we used to just kick it in our rehearsal hall. As a matter of fact, that's where we came up with All the Way Live and uh, Fantasia Voyage. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Right there. But looking at yeah. that, that, Fred, looking at it, why do you think your music stays so relevant? 40 years later, young people just love it. They hear the music and they just start dancing. 40 years Well, later. I think it's because of the stories. Yeah. You know, it's like a, it's like an old book. Mm -hmm. It's all about the story. Yeah. And if you make it about the story and you make the music good, mm -hmm. people will remember it. You know, I know it's a lot of songs that are out now that you're not gonna remember next year. Yeah. yeah. But the ones that have really good stories, you'll remember them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about the story. And then you guys stayed together. You all kept going. You kept moving. You kept moving forward through each one of the the years. All of the years you kept going together. Well, we had to. We don't know how to do anything <laughs> else. I mean. <laughs> I could just see myself Try to go going to the job and <laughs> that first time on the job. What is he doing? <laughs> you know, he's fired. Get him out of here. You know, <laughs> I mean, I know how to play music. That's what I do. You right. know, anything else I would probably be very bad at, you know, wow. and that's, that's, that's what we know how to do. So we all had the same purpose. I think mm -hmm. 
if you get a bunch of guys and they have the same purpose, then that's a recipe for longevity. Right. You just, you just have to love the same thing. And we love the same things. And we love being good. Right. That was the thing about this band that always impressed me. They just love being good. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't care who else was on stage. We'll play with anybody. We don't care because we're going to go do our homework and we're going to make sure that we handle our business and and, and get right with it, you know. Mm-hmm. So you know, we always enjoyed playing with other groups. I mean, George Clinton, uh, Lenny Williams. I mean, we played with everybody. So when we see them now, it's like, oh, man, what's up, man? Good to see you, you know. It's that kind of camaraderie, even in the industry. Right. And because we all know that longevity has its place. And it's a lot of our brothers and sisters not that are not around right now. Mm-hmm. So it's a blessing for us to just see one another every time. Every time I see Michael Cooper or every yeah. time I see Felton, you know, we're so glad to see one another because we, you know, you never know. You can't call it. You sure so can. in the right. plans, when you see one another, let's just in, in, enjoy the moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then just to know that all of you all have had just the longevity in music. And then you see uh, other artists that have come in, had great hits, but aren't are no longer there. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what I'm saying. You can't call it. I mean, God has really blessed us mm-hmm. to be here. And I think our purpose has always been. To make people happy. Right. I, I can recount a situation to just make a long story short where we did a date in St. Louis and uh, this woman's husband, he had lost his brother and she wanted to do something nice for him to surprise him. So she brought him to our show. Mm-hmm. And when she brought him to our show, they came backstage and we got a chance to meet him. And the first thing he said was, man, this was just what I needed. Right. You know, and it just made me feel so good to know we changed his old vibe just behind him coming to the show. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. stuff like that really gets you. I had a couple of people come up to me and say, man, that song you wrote, say yes. I made two or three babies off of that song. <laughs> <laughs> You're you know, responsible stuff like for that, that. Brent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I said you were responsible for those children. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have to spend no money on them. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. But and yeah, you know, stuff like that makes you feel like this is why we do this, right. you know. And mm-hmm. I would rather be in a business where I make people happy, right, than in a business where you know, I'm repossessing somebody's car. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to do that. Right. You know, it. I mean, it'd be like, well, what happened to the car? Well, he got away from me. <laughs> 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 you know, because I just couldn't do it. You know, right. they fired me right on the spot. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Everybody remembers you, you guys, by your costumes. At first, it was unison, where you would wear everything that looked alike, and then you changed the costumes. <laughs> How did that come about? Well, we actually we were costumes from the very beginning. Uh-huh. We did one album, uh, the Power LP, where we tried to be the regular guy. Right. And it just didn't work, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it just didn't work. And, uh, you know, because the first, first album was actually uh, Robin Hood and the Merry Men. Mm-hmm. You know, the shot of love, they shoot that, born arrow, you hit the girl, you right. get the girl, you know what yeah. I'm saying? So it was that kind of concept. And then Rough Riders, where we were cowboys, mm-hmm. you know, uh, even the Untouchable, where we were the G-men. But our G-men was the groove men, but we looked like the G-men from the 40s and 50s, you know, yeah. just sort of like a play on words. Uh, till like now, from the Fantastic Voyage album, we're out there as pirates. Mm-hmm. And because we want, when people come to the show, we want it to be an event. Right. So we're like pirates right now. And, uh, you know, like when we were with Solar, 
back in the day when we get ready to record that album, um, the record company really fought us after Rough Riders. They wanted us to be Rough Riders rides again. <laughs> and we were on purpose, didn't want to be the same thing because that meant every time we could be whatever we wanted to be and people would get used to that. Right. So what happened, a couple of black newspapers kept talking about how we put brothers in, in situations where you never saw us a lot. I mean, you didn't see a lot of black cowboys mm -hmm. or black pirates, you know, or anything like that. And so we had fun doing it because we looked just as good as, <laughs> you know, our blue-eyed soul brothers. Right. So we were like, well, okay, we can do this and then we can be whatever we want to be. Right. And and we didn't want to have a ceiling, you know, and I'm so glad we did that because right today we can be whatever we want to be. But we had to fight the record company really hard for the Fantasia Voyage album because it was like, well, you know, Pirates is negative. And mm -hmm. we was like, well, no, man, we're going to make it a, a, a positive thing. And they was like, well, how can you do that as Pirates? I say, well, we'll be Buccaneers. <laughs> But we didn't realize Buccaneers was worse than Pirates. <laughs> but it just sounded better, right? Right. So they was like, well, okay. They didn't realize Buccaneers was as bad as Pirates either. So, you know, that's how we ended up getting Fantastic Voyage album. But boy, we had to fight for that album. Yeah. The thing about it now, though, is that you have rec you had record labels then that had you could put a lot of money behind the artist and you know really push the artist and make the artist you know who they yeah. wanted them to be. Now we don't have that; it's more independent. Well, you know, it was like you had school for artists, you know, for the artists that wasn't really seasoned. Right. You know, if you had a company, the other artists would help the artist that was kind of new to the game. Mm -hmm. And then they always sort of had a structure. I mean, you had an A&R person, you had a choreographers, you had right. all of these people that help an artist be an artist. Uh, you you kind of see it in, in, in some of the other countries now, you know, like Japan, they, a lot of the artists want to be like Americans, mm -hmm. uh, Korea, South Korea. Look at the band they have now, BTS where they came from them watching artists in America. Right. Now they're big artists around the world, you know, just from looking at our singers and, and doing steps and choreography and stuff like that. Uh, it, it Most of this stuff comes from America, mm -hmm. you know, and and, uh, and some of it comes from Europe, but you, you have uh, now, you know, a lot of artists that they can do really good records, but they have a hard time doing concerts. Right. You know, because uh, you got to entertain. You do. You know, you really got to entertain. And, and some of them do it well, and some of them don't. Mm -hmm. And so that was always the thing with record companies. I would love to see record companies again. I know you don't have to have a record company to, to put out a record now, but artist development always had its place. Right. Right. Absolutely. And now it just seems that any we're going to listen to it, you know, no matter what the showmanship, whatever it is, uh, as most people say, you know, it's not. And I've heard all the legends this week say the same thing, just like yourself, saying that it is uh, a place where the yeah. record label really, really took care of everything. Yeah. Yeah, and all you had to do was be creative. You know, now, in order to get any kind of deal, even with a reputable record company, if, if that's what you want to do, uh, you still got to do everything. Mm -hmm. It's got to be ready to go. All they want to do is distribute it. That's it. They don't want to do nothing else. Mm -hmm. And so you already have to do it anyway. So I applaud the young brothers that, that changed the game a little and said, well, man, you know, I can just do my own record and do it on my own label, wow. which is cool. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's good for capitalism. But still, I think 
there is a place for record companies in terms of artist development. You know, the Ushers and the Johnny Gills, those guys, you know, even if they're younger than us, maybe 10 years, 10, 10 or 15 years younger than us, they still came from record companies. They did, yes. I yes, can yes. remember when Usher was, was a young dude. Mm -hmm. I can remember when Johnny first came on the scene. Mm -hmm. I can re remember when New Edition first came out and we were doing dates with them. They had artist development. Right. Yeah, they went in the rehearsal halls mm -hmm. and they sit up there and perfected those moves and, and rehearse over and over and over. We got to want to put in the work if we want to be the best. Yes. And that's where longevity comes in. They're still out there, too. Your Johnny Gills, your Ushers, yourself. And that's, I believe. I mean, Johnny got a new record. That's yeah. a bomb. You know, yeah. I'm like, OK. Yeah. Yeah. So well, with artist development, you know, like if you we said, put in the work, we can last. Yeah. 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 You're right. But I believe, like you said, with the artist development, with that whole package, that's what worked. That's what works. Artist development. Mm -hmm. And you can see even the Johnny Gills and the New Edition. They've been around a little while now. Yes. And it's only because of artist development. Mm hmm. Because if you come in at, you know, 16, 17 year old kid, what do you really know unless, you know, you've had your band the whole time? Right. Or you've had your group the whole time. You really don't know what to do. And then it takes somebody, you know, just kind of taking you under their wing. That's what's missing right now. We don't have any artist development anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these acts would be better if they had artist development, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's something they need to teach in school, uh, how to be an artist after right. you've learned your trade and learned your instrument mm -hmm. and how to get a gig. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, some of these, you know, kids don't even know how to do a contract. Absolutely. What would you like to leave with the viewers, my friend? You say what now? What would you like to leave with the viewers? Oh, well, I would just like to let everybody know, thank you guys. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Let me give you a big hug <laughs> because if it weren't for you guys, there is no way yeah. we would have been around the world. There's no way that uh, we would still be together. There is no way we would have seen the power of selling a record. And it's because you guys showed us who we are. And I want to thank you guys for that because you guys don't get enough credit for what you do for us. And I hope that, you know, we hit a home run with you guys on trying to make you happy. We're working on uh, new league size stuff. We got some stuff that was never released uh, that we've worked on, been working on, uh, and we kind of call it Lost Tracks mm -hmm. of Lakeside. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to work on a campaign for it right now. Cam, I might have to call you and get some ideas. There you go. But uh, we want to we wanna drop something uh, 2021, you know, maybe the first part of the year, something that I think you're really going to like. Uh, we got a couple of ladies records that I think the women are going to really – love because we give it up to our, our sisters you know what i'm saying because yeah. uh -huh. they, they, they really make the world go around so uh we're going to come with some more music and i just want our, all of our fans to know that we really appreciate it if nobody never told you from this group i'm telling you we love you guys we appreciate you thank you for all you do to make us feel good thank you for coming to the shows and supporting us after all this time, you know, they come and say, wow, they don't look like a bunch of old men on stage. <laughs> I mean, we are, but we just do what we do. Absolutely. I appreciate you so much. That's Fred Alexander from the original Lakeside. Thank you so thank much, Thank you, Cam. Man, for everything. Thank you for keeping it alive, too, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, buddy. Happy holidays, and God bless you and your Happy family. Happy holidays to you, too. Merry <laughs> Christmas. Merry Christmas. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you guys next week. We have a full lineup. Talk to you then, one, uh, 1230 to 130 Central Standard Time. Bye.